Hey everybody, today we're going to start talking about the history of the Egyptian god Set, or as I usually tend to call him, Setesh. We'll probably alternate between the two throughout this. This is going to be kind of just a read-through of the paper I've already released, um, I think at the end of last year, earlier this year, called Redeeming the Egyptian God of Darkness. And it's just kind of a, it's about a 60-page paper going through just the history of Set and kind of his fall, his rise again, and then his ultimate fall at the end of the, of the 20th dynasty. Set has been known to humanity since before recorded history, written, written language, or even civilization itself. The god was already recognized prior to the founding of ancient Egypt, and he remained an active part of the pantheon for several thousand years. The, vener the veneration of Set can be traced back to the sky religion, where he was the lord of darkness and storms and which centered around the worship of the night sky, storms, the desert oasis, and all things foreign to both Egypt and Earth. He was directly associated with the northern circumpolar stars, specifically our Big Dipper. The circumpolar stars represented immortality, freedom from the cycles of the rest of the cosmos, including all the other gods. These cycles were seen in the seasons, the moon and planet, even the rotation of the zodiac and the gods themselves. To Egypt, it was only the stars in the far north which never sank below the horizon. This made it the original realm associated with the afterlife, in which one would become a god themselves. In the early historical period, as the land progressively turned to desert and no man's flood for water, the sun was hated as an enemy which scorched and burned, and so storms and nighttime were reprieved from that. The oldest attested name of the god appears to be Satesh, though more common translations are Set, Seth, or Sutek. The sky religion included beliefs such as an individual being or becoming a god or imperishable spirit after death, and values such as removing a king who had lost the ability to properly rule, or trying to stave off priestly corruption. The material body did not hold the importance it would later on with mummification, and people were buried in shallow graves, laying on their left side, in the fetal position, with simple grave goods. Sometimes the body was cut into pieces, and grave goods had a northern-southern orientation, referencing the northern stars rather than the solar cycle. People were often buried with flint tools, including knives and lances, which were associated with Set and the northern skies. Prior to burials, it seems individuals may have been cremated and possibly used in rainmaking rituals. Like many Egyptian deities, Set was often portrayed as a human-animal hybrid or an animal altogether. Unlike most deities, the Set, or S the set animal, or Sha, is a fabricated creature, feeding into his outsider, otherworldly nature. He was by no means the only example of such a fabricated creature in Egypt, like those seen in the Beni Hassan tombs, and the quest to identify a quote-unquote real set animal is as futile as trying to find a real-life dragon or griffin. Other common manifestations of the god were donkeys, hippos, pigs, snakes, and more. The constellation associated with him, as we have already said, was the Big Dipper. It was usually associated with a bull or bull's leg. Because of this, bulls were seen as a manifestation of Set, who was sometimes called the Great Bull or similar similar titles. The word for bull, ka, was the same word used for the divine spark or double of the Egyptian soul. While most Egyptian constellations did not resemble ours, the dipper appears to be identical, likely due to it being an asterism rather than simply a constellation. Son of Newt, the sky goddess, usually indicated set in specific rather than any of his siblings in myth where he has them. He was not born through normal means, but rather broke out of the sky fully formed. His realm was Upper, Southern Egypt, though in reality there were groups dedicated to him in both Upper and Lower Egypt throughout its history. Satesh was also one of the earliest known deities of deification, the individual being or becoming a god or imperishable spirit in the northern skies after their death. In this sense, he was a psychopomp, a benevolent guide for the dead on their journey to the afterlife. Many gnomes, which were like little tribal cities kind of before city-states really formed, many gnomes were dedicated to Set, the oldest being the city of Nut or Ombos, town of gold, part of the Nakata culture, and where possibly the first temple of Set stood. Early on, the Egyptians did not have some single united mythology as the modern world tends to believe. Each gnome held their patron deity in the highest regard, and they would often be considered the creator or at least a being of extreme importance in that gnome whereas another town may have a completely different mythology and ranking of the gods. To early Egypt, this was not a problem. Set was also associated with the oases of the western deserts, where travelers would carve out images to him before or after crossing the sands. Horus the Elder was the balance to Set, 
they were light and dark, day and night, where neither was superior over the other, and the two worked together to help the dead ascend to the imperishable stars. Sometimes Set and Horus the Elder would combine into a single deity, one with both their heads, but a single body. And in other cases, both have been depicted as hawks. The Shah animal was often paired with a hawk-headed griffin, as seen in the Beni Hassan tombs again. And these two gods were the foundation of all early Egyptian religion. In some stories, the moon, equivalent to the god of mediation and wisdom, Thoth, is born of a pairing of Horus, the elder, and Set. The pyramid texts even state that it is the finger of Set which gives the eye of Horus its magic. However, this was not always the case, as there exists evidence of an early conflict between the followers of Horus and Set in Upper Egypt. Some have even theorized that the victorious devotees of Horus oppressed those of Set, and yet the two gods were clearly integrated in a positive way before the coming of Osiris in the 4th or 5th dynasty, and also when the pyramid texts were written. It is true that the religion of Horus appears to be more brutal than that of Set, with early dynastic burials by kings like Horus Aha involving mass human sacrifice. This may have evolved from the fall of the sky religion where the king was meant to sacrifice himself into one where the king could sacrifice others for renewal and eventually where those others were sacrificed for the king's benefit even after death. It is somewhat ironic to me that the Horus worshippers did this considering the reputation Set has today. This was a clear change in the relationship between the elite classes and religion. But whatever the case may have been, by the time of the Old Kingdom and even after the coming of Osiris in many cases, Horus the Elder and Set were equals and seemed positive, positively as they helped the dead become a deity. Set was responsible for protecting the light and sun every night from returning to primordial chaos, envisioned as a giant serpent named, named Apep. In this role, he was likely the original Chaos Comp hero, protagonist of a myth in which a hero defeats a beast of chaos. Unlike the later tellings of Chaos Comp, such as the Greek Zeus, Slavic Perun, or Hebrew Yahweh, the myth of Set was not intended to set him up as a king of the gods. In fact, he was never king of the gods, simply one who wielded profound respect and fear. Along with animals sacred to him, one of the most sacred symbols of Set was the Wasp Scepter, a staff held by humans and gods alike, which was designed based off the head of the Shah animal. This represented the wielding of, the wielding of the power of Set in the earlier traditions, rather than holding him at bay as in later times. We not only see the scepter in art, but have found real life versions of them as well, suggesting they had actual applications as magical tools. The adz, a tool used in the Egyptian opening of the mouse ceremony, was fashioned based on the shape of the Big Dipper and was sometimes made of material sacred to set, such as meteoric rock. These rock were sacred to him because they were foreign to the earth from the heavens. Copper adzes were included in early grave goods as well. It has even been suggested that the so-called Shed Shed, often, often accompanying the god Wepwawet, and perhaps even the symbol of the royal placenta which granted life to the king, are based off meteorites and thus related to Set, though this does seem to be somewhat of a fringe theory from what I've found. The opening of the mouth was the most important ritual in deification, as it allowed the individual to eat, drink, speak, breathe, move, see, etc. in the afterlife. Another tool associated with Set and used in the opening of the mouth ceremony was the Pesesh, Pesesh Kef knife or lance. The white and red crowns are also important symbols of the deity. While the white crown is generally associated with Upper Egypt and Satesh, and the red with Lower Egypt and Horus the Elder, it is actually likely that both have their origin in the Upper Region, which would make sense as Set and Horus both have their origin in the Upper Region as well. It also makes sense since Red was most associated with Set rather than Horus. The crowns represented rulership over all Egypt and were often worn by kings or gods like Horus the Elder. Most images involving Set wearing both crowns, or well, one or both crowns, I found in the 2nd, 12th, 18th, 19th, and 20th dynasties, who we will see were the ruling families most dedicated to him. Despite the coming of Osiris during the creation of the pyramid texts and that ideology, Many positive verses related to Set have survived, and we'll look at some of those a bit later. These include, but are not limited to, verses in which tools of Set are used to open the mouth of the gods. Set gives sight to the eye of Horus the Elder. Set and his wife proclaim that the dead choose if the gods themselves live or die. The dead is equated with Set and its place in the northern skies, and the dead and Set are equally associated with eternal life. In the Second Dynasty, it had already become common for the king to take a quote-unquote Horus name, a throne name written in a serech and topped with the god Horus the Elder. Yet one king, Peribsen, 
removed Horace the Elder, and replaced the falcon with the set animal. History has shown that Peribson was not some sort of heretic or monotheist, which is what people had originally believed about him. He was simply a henotheist, one who believed in many gods but preferred one or a few specifically. And he had a special relationship with Set while allowing other people to worship whichever gods they preferred as well. We know that he wasn't hated because his funerary cult still existed in the fourth dynasty. This was also kind of prior to the coming of Osiris to Egypt or any of the demonizations Set would later undergo, meaning it is only our bias towards the Osiris, Osiris myth and that understanding of Egyptian mythology which makes us, us think Peribsen was up to no good. At the time, this was not a problem. His reign was one of cultural and religious evolution, and the first complete known Egyptian sentence is a blessing from his patron. The Golden One, he of Ombos, has unified and handed over the two realms to his son, the king of Lower and Upper Egypt, Peribsen. The sentence further confirms the country was not divided under the king's rule. Peribsen was worship, also worshipped the gods Min and Ash, further proving he was not a monotheist. Min is another of the oldest known gods, having belonged to the same early sky and desert religion as Set. And Ash shared many of the and Ash shared the same fabricated animal head as Set, and was an early god associated with the desert, an aspect Set seems to have absorbed early on. The king honored his patron in Lower Egypt, suggesting the country was not divided, and also created a cult center for Sesh at Nup. Many during this era would share in a tomb design common at the time, that of the Mastaba, which I have always personally preferred to the pyramid, not sure why. These were trapezoidal pre predecessors to the pyramids we know, with a north-south rather than east-west orientation due to the stellar rather than solar focus. The trapezoidal shape would imp inspire important symbolism later on, such as with the pylon gates of temples. Peribson's successor, Kasa Kemwe, also put a set animal on top of a seric, this time along with Horus the Elder. Some suggest this is evident of dissent among the population regarding Peribson, but again, that is from a post Osiren view of Set, where he is a god of evil and violence. Now, the first main shift in mythology was between the original sky religion and that of the solar religion, which was about the sun in specific rather than light and dark as equals, and this centered around the cult of Ra. As this sun god and his worshippers became more powerful in the 4th dynasty, Ra played an increasingly vital role in Egyptian myth. Continuing in the tradition of Chaos Comp, Set was seen as the adopted son of Ra and rode at the head of the solar bark each night when it journeyed into the underworld to face Apep. Here Set was not yet demonized, still defending the gods, but certainly was relegated to a position below that of the sun god, his strength recognized to use and defeat the primordial serpent. However, the big change that came for Set was the coming of Osiris in the 4th or 5th dynasty, when the pyramid texts were being compiled. It is currently unknown where Osiris came from, but he was not there in pre- and early dynastic period. The worshippers of Osiris told a much different story than that of the Egyptians had used before, in which Osiris was the greatest god, king of the gods, whereas Set was relegated to the position of his evil, traitorous, and murderous brother. Instead of a great, benevolent deity with positive associations, Set was now a jealous monster who murdered Osiris and chopped his body into pieces. The great goddess Isis was made into the wife of Osiris, and the ancient Horus the Elder was made into Horus the Younger, son of Osiris. Even Anubis, the son of Set, was changed to the son of Osiris, and the followers, followers of Osiris did this by having Set's wife cheat on him with Osiris. It's pretty clear that these individuals did not respect the nature of the gods as the early Egyptians knew them. They were interested in being above all, rather than one god among hundreds. The nature of the afterlife also changed significantly with the coming of Osiris, though it did take a great amount of time and did not happen right away by any means. Instead of the individual pulling themselves up to the sky and level of the gods, they now had to seek acceptance from the pantheon at the weighing of the heart, to show their values and acts aligned with the will and laws of Osiris. Osiris was the first mummy, increasing the importance of the material body to the spirit and starting the crossover between materialism and spirituality we still have to deal with today. The only options were the individual were non-existence if they were unworthy, a life similar to the life on earth where they remained ruled over by and in service to Osiris, or the only kind of deification left where the individual could become one with Osiris but not an independent god themselves. Even once the religion of Osiris became more popular overall, small groups dedicated to Set would remain. In the stories of these groups, their patron would not have been seen in a diminished or negative role like the Osirians did. 
Certain takes have it where Thoth is the one who convinces Set to kill Osiris, though his reasons for doing so are unclear. One possibility is that they saw the relationship between Nephtys and Osiris as the latter assaulting the former, though it could simply be due to the wrongs done against Set overall. Either way, Thoth would sometimes stand beside Set against Horus the Younger in his bid to be ruler of all Egypt, and in the pyramid text neither Thoth nor Set weeps for Osiris. During the late period, Thoth would take over the positive roles of Set, and one of the Greco-Roman names for the god is an ideogram made from the outcast symbol for Set, the feather of Ma'at, and a seated Thoth. There are also verses in the pyramid text consisting of spells warding off Osiris and Horus the Younger, and again we'll look at some of those in a bit. As history transitioned into the Middle Kingdom period, there were attempts to keep Set's more positive rules in place. He could be seen as an initiator of Osiris, even carrying Osiris into the afterlife on his back in the form of a bull. As mentioned, the Adz was shaped after, Set, after Set's constellation and was required for the dead to survive in the afterlife. Osiris was no exception to this, having to undergo that ceremony as well. Set could further be seen as the initiator of Horus the Younger, the necessary force to prepare his nephew for kingship one day. The scriptures surrounding death moved from the pyramid text to the coffin text, which show evidence of Set's new role and traits, while also keeping some of his positive associations, such as the Defender of Ra. During the 12th dynasty, Set can be seen blessing kings with important staffs, as well as in the act of uniting Upper and Lower Egypt with Horus. And Set is shown at the Sed Festival of Senwarset III. In the Middle Kingdom period, it was common for Set to appear on magical wands, which were used by priests and healers in magical ceremonies and rituals. Along with such wands, priests carry statues of goddess holding serpents and serpent wands as well. Set appears as a bull on at least one of these wands, and often he appears as the Shah animal alongside other fantastic animals, as well as the goddess Tauret, who is sometimes his consort. Along with her and Nephtys, the main consorts of Set were Anat and Astarte. Meanwhile, this, his most common children were Anpu, Wipwaret, and Sobek though Set was also sometimes related to infertility and castration. It's also important to note that Anat and Astarte were foreign goddesses related to Set because he was the god of foreigners and all things foreign. And they were also goddesses of fertility and love, as well as war. In the Coffin text, Set's name was often written as a symbol that has been translated as to separate, isolator, and outcast, although I think outcast is the most popular definition, definition in the current day. The symbol was probably based on the Peseshkef flint knife or lance, which was used to sever the umbilical cord, much like Set defeating Apep and separating the child from the waters of chaos. Again, this tool was used at least as far back as the Nakata periods and associated with Set and the opening of the mouth ritual as well. Despite the state of limbo Set existed in, there were still positive associations and roles for him in the coffin texts. During the second intermediate period, Lower Egypt was ruled by foreigners centered in the city of Avaris, a uh, ancient home of Set. These Hyksos rulers identified the Egyptian storm god with their own storm god Baal, Baal, even considering Astarte, the consort of Baal, to be the wife of Setesh. And if I understand correctly, this is Baal Hadad, but I'll just be calling him uh, Baal going forward. Despite bringing technological advancements to Egypt like chariots, which I've actually, I think that might be contested now, but the mainstream idea is that despite bringing technological advancements to Egypt like the chariots, the Egyptians hated these foreign rulers, and with that hatred came more hatred for their patient deity. And again, I think this is, as we gain more information, this is actually getting a bit more complicated, like maybe the Hyksos and Egypt didn't hate each other right away. Maybe the chariots were introduced from somewhere external can't really get into that right now. Eventually, the Hyksos were defeated by the Egyptian 18th dynasty, who overthrew them, and they helped Set survive his association with those rulers. Tutmos I built a temple for him at Nut, and Tutmos III depicted himself with the god as a teacher, specifically teaching how to hunt and do archery and stuff like that. Hatshepsut was shown being blessed by Set, and once again we find images of the crowned deity. It is during this time that we find the first and most complete astronomical ceiling in the tomb of Hatshepsut's architect, Sinenmut, which granted immense importance to the northern circumpolar stars. I actually put out a video discussing this already and the northern circumpolar stars. 
It's on the same channel. It's called Seeking the Imperishable Constellations of Ancient Egypt. But everything changed in the 18th dynasty when we get a king who comes in who took the name Akhenaten, the first monotheist in human history. Akhenaten believed in a solar deity called the Aten and believed this deity was the one and only god out there. He was not a henotheist like Peribson had been. Akhenaten outright banned the polytheistic traditions of ancient Egypt, closed temples, destroyed statues, and so on. Akhenaten believed the only ones who could worship the Aten directly were his own family, with all others having to worship that family rather than the god directly. All of this clearly set the precedence for the church and monotheism as we now know it. Along with all the other gods, Set was cast down. The destruction of temples was not only religious, but these were also major centers of resources for the cities they resided in, meaning their closure caused all sorts of problems beyond those of spirituality. In my opinion, it is not hard to see the negatives of monotheism here even so early on, and the Egyptians at the time seemed to have felt the same. The son of Akhenaten was the famous boy King Tut, who ruled until only 19 years of age. Though Tut would change his name to once again reference Amun in the traditional pantheon, and issue an edict against Atenism, though more likely this was the word of Horemheb than Tut, he was young and did little to impress beyond providing the most intact tomb, which is kind of sadly what he's famous for. For a brief period after his death, Tut was succeeded by a king named Ai, who may have been the last remaining sympathizer of Atenism, though this is not confirmed. However, I had an extremely short rule and was quickly replaced by my personally favorite pharaoh, Horemheb. Horemheb was not of royal blood and was likely born a commoner. He rose quickly through the military and appears to have been a respected, a respected scribe, eventually finding himself in the employ of the king Ak Akhenaten and later his son. There is no evidence suggesting Horemheb actually ever committed to the new Atenist religion, however. It appears he was somewhat of a surrogate father to Tut, trying to guide him in the restoration of Egyptian polytheism. Some think I may have usurped the throne when the child died and Horemheb was away in battle, suggesting he still believed in the religion of Akhenaten, but it is unclear what exactly occurred and we will likely never know for sure. Horemheb, se Horemheb seems to have been a just ruler who protected the lower classes and all citizens from the corruption of the priesthoods, creating the great edict of Horemheb towards this end. He also moved the capital away from the city Akhenaten had built. His noble character is suggested by the act of taking in and mentoring the son of his enemies, when he could have done anything up to and including murdering the young boy. At the time of Tut's death, Hormhub was building a non-royal tomb for himself and was far away in battle, further confirming he had no plans in taking kingship, and he had no reason to think Tut would not have children prior to his abrupt death. Immediately upon becoming king, he went full force at restoring Egypt to pluralistic polytheism, which was his main focus, and Set seems to have been central to this restoration project. Horemheb was de depicted holding hands with Set and Horus, and Horemheb chose a high priest of Set from Abaris, Ramses I, as well as his son, Seti I and grandson, Ramses II, to inherit his, thr his throne and create the new 19th dynasty when it became clear he would not have his own children. Ramses I and his family had been connected to Set of Avarice for many generations, even before the coming of the Hyksos, as far as we can tell. Ramses I or his father is thought to have been the high priest of Set there during the reign of Horemheb, with his son Seti I possibly being a priest of the patron as well. They played a critical role in the re restoration of polytheism in ancient Egypt. Ramses' father's name was Seti, whose grandson would share that name, and this translates to Man of Set. Under their reign, many people took names related to the god Set as well. However, there are clear instances of some like Seti I replacing Set in his cartouche with Osiris or Isis, quote-unquote, pragmatically erring on the side of caution, as Ian Taylor said in Deconstructing the Iconography of Set. Basically, in place of sacred to Osiris, even though his name was written with Set in the cartouche, it would be replaced with another god. The Tale of Two Brothers is, is an example of mythology surrounding Set, where the god is not directly named or referenced, instead having a symbolic stand-in. And in cases where Set was equated with Baal, the enemy of Baal and Asarte was Yom, who acted as a stand-in for Osiris as the enemy to the king, playing the role of Set or Baal. In this way, those dedicated to Set could criticize Osiris without explicitly doing so. As with other kings who adored Set, the family were henotheists, happy to let people worship whichever gods they preferred. 
and after Akhenaten, they were much more wary of pushing their preferred deity over the others. Amun and Set, sometimes with Ra, Horus on the horizons, were all worshipped together during this time, even sharing temples and priests. And both Amun and the confined, combined form of Amun-Ra were equated with Set as well. Seti I helped to rebuild and expand the Egyptian empire and face their, face their rival, rival Hittites in war. He also engaged in many important mining operations before passing the crowns of Egypt onto his son, Ramses II. Seti's tomb contained an astrono astronomical ceiling like that of Senenmut from the 18th dynasty, again with extreme importance being given to the northern circumpolar stars. And again, this is covered in the video Seeking the Imperishable Stars of Ancient Egypt. Now, Ramses II is known by many as the greatest king, even being called Ramses the Great. He followed in the footsteps of his father and grandfather, continuing the war with the Hittite Empire, out of which came the first peace treaty in human history, with both sides agreeing to a truce and even becoming friends. Once again, there was a crossover between Set and Baal, and Ramses II erected the 400-year stele and to honor this connection. The stele showed Seti, either the father of Ramses I or II, giving honor to Set, who took the form of Baal rather than the Set animal in this instance. The 400 years referenced the time of their deity being worshipped in avarice prior to the Hyksos arriving, and there is evidence that Set and Baal were equated as early as the 13th dynasty. Not only was this to validate the idea of Set and Baal being the same deity, but that they had been so since before the Hyksos rulers, thus bringing the god fully out of any slump caused during the intermediate period. Besides the familial and religious connections Ramses already had with Set, he was a redhead and thus associated with the god, whose main color and hair were red. Egypt underwent a golden era during the rule of Ramses, and he lived to quite an old age, even outliving many of his subjects and children. The king focused much of his energy on temples and restoration projects, as well as building entirely new structures. One of the most significant was Abu Simbel, where Ramses II represented himself as a deified god in the age-old tradition. The Ramazeum was built to honor the deified king and contained a temple to his father, Seti, as well. He also worked on the temples of Set, including the destruction of a temple to the Aten at Montmar, which he replaced to one dedicated to Set. Finally, Ramses the Great built a new capital for himself in the delta near the city of Avaris, Pi Ramses with the four parts of the city dedicated to Wajet, Amun, Astarte, and Set. Indeed, in Priests of Ancient Egypt, Serge Sonoran stated that, worried of Thebes and its two enterprising priests, he went to build a new capital, Pi Ramsi, in the eastern delta, where he could worship at his ease the gods dearest to him, in accord to Amun, only second place. And I actually believe Seti the first began work on Pi Ramses, but it didn't really take off until Ramses II, if I understand correctly. The first king of the 20th dynasty, many generations after the death of Ramses II, was Setnapt, who took the name Victorious of Set, Beloved of Ra, and sometimes was known as Kefri Set. While only ruling for a few years, his son Ramses III, taking his name from his hero Ramses II, was extremely important in repelling the threat of the mysterious sea people who were decimating the area around the Mediterranean at the time. Between Ramses II and Ramses III, there had been much disruption in Egypt, an empire lost without the king who had ruled for many lifetimes. These two men, Setnat and Ramses III, managed to unify the country for what could be considered the last time, and Ramses III is often called the last great king of Egypt. Ramses III also restored the temple to Set at Nupt as well. However, unhappy with kings who tried to keep their corruption in line, Ramses III was eventually murdered in a conspiracy for power within his own priesthoods and harem. It was in that moment that Egypt as it been would die, ready to decay and inevitably be picked over by the Greeks and Romans. Now a quick note on this last section. You may notice that as time goes on, the focus becomes more centralized on kings representing Set rather than Set himself, as his true nature has already been explored. The study of these kings is the study of Set as well. The positive discussions of monarchs and such may seem at odds with Western left-hand path, which is kind of what this, this channel is all about. But it's important to understand that there was no Western left-hand path in the times of ancient Egypt. And even at the time of the New Kingdom, the true, authentic, stellar tradition was something for, of the past that had already been rediscovered and mimicked. Democracy had not even been invented yet. While I would never support a modern monarchy, it is interesting to note how much better some, like Horem Heaven or Ramses II, were as rulers compared to even our modern quote-unquote democracy. 
The Edict of Horemheb, for example, sought to protect the people from being abused by those in power. Do you think something like that would ever work or happen in the 21st century where life is often little more than being manipulated by those in power? Anyways, from here, the main route for set was down into degradation. Gnomes and oases dedicated to set reported the fall of the god and lamented his demise. And these can be summarized thusly. They see how Set has fallen on his side, robbed of land in all his places. His gnomes lament and mourn. Lamentation goes around in them. The oases are in affliction. Disaster goes about in them, and they make plaint. Their lord is not in his territory. The gnomes are a desolate place. They are pulled down. Their temples are destroyed. All who belong to them are not. Their lord is not. He who thinks of enmity is not. Images of Set were attacked as were ideologies centering around him and eventually he would only be known in alternative forms corresponding to real animals, rather than the set animal. Sometimes he was seen as a giant, hissing, fire-breathing serpent called Bin, as well as a pig or hippo, and to Egyptians and outsiders alike, he became the equivalent of the chaos serpent Apep, rather than the one who defended against the monster. There are numerous images of Set as a donkey being killed or sacrificed in these times especially, and when the Greeks came in, they transferred this imagery of Set into the Greek magical papyri, where Set was mainly invoked as a donkey. The Greeks further associate him with Typhoon, a giant donkey-headed serpentine monster which had been created to dethrone the king of the gods, Zeus. With this translation of Set into Apep and then Typhoon, his role in the myth of Chaos Conf was forever changed. Instead of filling the role of hero against the beast of chaos, Set himself became the beast of chaos to be defeated. Zeus defeated him as Typhoon, Perium defeated, defeated him as Velas, and even Yahweh cast him down as Leviathan in Nehushtan. When Christianity came about, all deities were turned into devils, and Set was no exception. Sometimes Christian thinkers even went so far as to see the god as Satan himself, and many texts exist incorrectly arguing that Set is the origin of the devil. I repeat, incorrectly arguing that Set was the origins of the devil. Despite all this, the role of Set would not remain entirely negative. In some Greek works, Set is recognized for his uniqueness and immortality, having yet to be conquered, and he was sometimes invoked positively for the benefits of the magician. As humanity approached the Common Era, a new ideology was arising in the form of Jewish Gnosticism, especially under groups such as the Ophites, named for their love of serpentine divinities. These Gnostics came to believe that the material world was the creation of a lesser, ignorant if not malevolent god which they called the Demiurge. It was believed that this Demiurge sought to enslave sought enslavement over the minds and bodies of mankind, and that an intentionally obscured history or twisted mythology to empower, to empower himself. I believe this can be compared to the coming of Osiris in early Egypt, as well as the Aten in the New Kingdom. Like Osiris and then Aten, the Demiurge sought to obscure history so it could better rule over the affairs of humanity. This can involve dehumanizing, uh, demonizing positive beings, changing mythological roles, adopting holidays, and even rewriting history to suit their needs, which is precisely how, precisely how the latecomer Osiris was able to gain so much power in worship. The Gnostics saw this negative being in the Old and later New Testament in the character of Yahweh. We will dive deeper a little bit into Gnosticism soon, but for now it is enough to say they believed in a negative entity trying to keep people from the more positive ones. Within this Gnostic system, the serpent was extremely positive, much at odds with the rest of Judaism and later Christianity and Islam. The snake in Eden was seen as a divine being sent by higher forces to free humanity from the demiurge via the apple, fig, or whatever it happened to be, rather than a vile being deserving eternal punishment. As Christianity spread, the serpent became associated with Christ himself by the Gnostics, and as we will investigate soon, Set became associated with the serpent in numerous different ways as well. So now as we get into the Judeo-Christian period, uh, we have the Book of Numbers in the Torah, which takes place during the exodus from Egypt. And we read an event where the Hebrew people complain to Yahweh about a lack of decent food and water. In response, Yahweh sends poisonous, quote unquote, fiery snakes to bite and harm his people as punishment for doubting him. Moses asks a way to heal his people, to which God tells him to build a staff with a serpent sitting on top of it, and all who look on it may be healed. Much later in history, we have Second Kings, during the reign of Hezekiah, where we learn that the serpent on a staff was itself worshipped, and we are told that the king struck it down in anger. It says he removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke into pieces the bronze serpent of Moses had made, 
because in those days the children of Israel burned incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. It's possible that the act of Hezekiah tearing down Nehushtan is a fabrication on the part of his revisionist successors. Hezekiah was quite fond of such iconography at the time, inspired by Egyptian symbols or even treasures directly from the land. The king was allied with Egypt until the Assyrian takeover, and the loot records of the Assyrians attest to staffs topped with serpents, as well as those topped with scarabs and other beings, from Egypt. Sometimes the snakes were winged, and there seems to have been staffs, and these seem to have been staffs of the Uraeus serpent of Egypt. This is the serpent you see all the time on the headdresses of the kings and gods. It's one of the most powerful symbols. It's even mentioned, you know, more recently in Crowley's Book of the Law. At this point in history, it was common for rulers in the area to use such winged Uraeus serpents in their own symbolism, showing there was no enmity towards the imagery. The name Nehushtan is a play on the Hebrew word Nahash, serpent, like the one in Eden, and the word for bronze or copper, meaning it was a bronze or brazen serpent. We are told this name Nehushtan was an insult, such as you brazen idolatrous thing. Hezekiah condemning it when he supposedly struck it down. Now, Nahash, the word for serpent, is made from the letters Nun, Het, and Shin in Hebrew, which are the roots for the words snake, divination, and shining. The later of these terms was also synonymous with bronze, and was often used to describe important glorious beings such as the Babylonian king in Isaiah, the bright morning star. Under the reign of Christianity, Christ would even call himself the bright morning star in Revelations. It is also unlikely that Nehushtan is a dis description of the idol because it would be a very rare use of this adj adjectival suffix in Hebrew. The only other use of the suffix is in the word Leviathan, which is a proper name for a serpent rather than an adjective, meaning Nehushan was also probably the proper name of a being or deity rather than a descriptive insult. Again, Hezekiah not only had no reason to insult it, but it would be a very strange word in Hebrew if it was indeed meant to describe something rather than be a proper name. And this proper name even has ties to Leviathan as the same suffix. The Nahash of Genesis, who gifted humans with the forbidden fruit, was one such quote-unquote shining being, rather than an actual snake. If the serpent was a seraphim, a serpentine, angel, a serpentine angel from Judaism, the curse of Yahweh to make it crawl in its belly makes far more sense as it originally had wings, just like the Uraeus serpent of Egypt often had, including on the staffs reported in the Assyrian loot records. Seraphim were not normal angels, for when the throne of Yahweh appeared to Isaiah, the god was accompanied by these seraphim who stood above him. The beings performed a ceremony on Isaiah's lips, allowing him to be purified enough to speak in the spiritual realm, much akin to the opening of the mouth in Egypt, allowing the dead to speak in the divine realm, and the purifications and tools that went along with it, several of which were related to Set, as we have already seen. Not only was Nehushtan likely a proper name, it may well be the name of the serpent from the Garden of Eden, who was cursed with the loss of his angelic wings. In the telling of Kings, we see that Nehushtan's staffs were related to Asherah in religious quote-unquote high places. Asherah was deeply associated with sacred trees as well, the two, the two often being equated. She often was a sacred tree. She was an ancient goddess related to Astarte and Anat, the foreign wives of Set, and some even tie Asherah, Astarte, and Anat together into a triad of goddesses, though this has been contested. In other words, Asherah seems to have been related to Set, at least indirectly, though may possibly be as close as a consort of his. Astarte, Anat, and Asherah with Set. Both religious high places, such as mountains and deserts, and trees, especially sycamore trees, were associated with Set even as far back as the pyramid texts. For example, Pyramid Text lines 915 to 916 say, Thou art on the way to the high places, to the places of Set. The high places will put him on the places of Set, even on that high sycamore cast of the sky. Sycamore trees were associated with immortality in Egypt. They were often connected to the sky goddess and mother of Set, Newt as a cow goddess, as well as the cow goddess Hathor, lady of the sycamore, who is sometimes directly associated with Set in myth and always indirectly related due to the relationship between cows and bulls. They further grew in the oasis and on the edges of the desert, the realms of Set. Now, sycamores are fig trees, which play a critical role in the fall of man myth. We have already tied Nehushtan directly to. 
despite commonly being an apple, it is more accurately, accurately thought that the forbidden fruit in Eden was a fig tree. Indeed, the closest thing Adam found to cover up with was a fig leaf. Further, Asherah trees are thought to have often been symbolized or stylized poles rather than legitimate trees, in some cases, like the pole Nehushan would later have sat on. Along with the more obvious ties to the Uraeus staffs already discussed, such standards were utilized in e early Egypt as well, especially in the upper Egyptian religion where sets thrived. Now, these ties between Asher and Nehushtan and Set run even deeper than this. Asher was often seen holding snakes or in association with them, with Asher trees often accompanying altars to the god Baal, who was equated with Set in Egypt. The association is even deeper when we factor in that the priests of Egypt used bronze serpent, bronze serpent wands and held statues of women carrying serpents when they were doing healing magic, much like Asherah later would in her association with serpents. Let's not forget that such priests also carried magic wands depicting Set as well. There is even theorized crossover between Asherah, the Egyptian priests, and the Minoan Mino snake goddesses who were depicted dancing with snakes, highly resembling Asherah figures. Here we can see a connected tradition in which both snakes and Set himself play vital roles in healing magic in some way, similar to how Asherah and her serpents later would. Another connection to Nehushtan is with the Greek medical staffs, examples of which are seen everywhere today because of their use in medicine. These fell under the domain of the gods Asclepius and Hermes, the latter of whom was equal to the Egyptian god Thoth, who could be a child of, aspect of, or at least sympathetic with Set. And Thoth was later equated with Set after Set fell and he kind of took over the positive roles of the god. This association, association is further cemented in the Mesopotamian god Ningishizida, a winged serpent deity who inhabited a great tree and was the first proper caduceus, as well as equivalent to Thoth, who became Hermes and associated with the caduceus, which was a snake on a staff. With all this considered, is it possible that Nehushtan is the equivalent of Set or Thoth or some sort of mix of both of them? In my opinion, this appears to be the case. The symbolism of Nehushtan clearly appears to be from the Egyptian tradition, and was associated with healing and fertility magic, which both Set and Thoth played important roles in. The god being on a standard or pole has its roots in the pre-dynastic religion of ancient Egypt, and we know with certainty that Nehushtan was a Uraeus serpent on a pole or inspired by one. Nehushtan was associated with high places as well as was Set, god of the mountainous deserts, and was associated with sacred trees related to the sky goddess, which Asherah came to represent. Asherah herself, whose sacred trees were associated with Nehushtan, was related to the other foreign consorts of Set, Anat and Astarte, and was also associated with altars to Baal, who the Egyptians equated with Set. Once he was demonized, Set became associated with a serpent, and Nehushtan seems to be related to the serpentine seraphim angels in Judaism, who utilized rituals similar to the opening of the mouth, which Set was intimately connected with, to allow Isaiah to speak in the divine realm. Set was associated with snakes after the New Kingdom as well, both at Edfu in specific and as equal to Apep in general. Through Thoth and the Egyptian priests, this symbol came to be used in conjunction with healing and similar magic, and so eventually was attributed to the use of Moses by the writers of Exodus for him to try and heal his people. The twisting of this being and symbol was likely intentional, trying to take an ancient and powerful image and give its power and importance to a god claiming to be the one and only. We could even read numbers as people getting attacked by the snakes in the desert, and Yahweh and Moses need to rely on the Egyptian power to heal them. So to just kind of sum up how this is relevant to Set, once he's fallen into a serpent form, he remains around through, you know, post-Egyptian traditions that stick around during the Ju during Judaism, and then comes to us through Christianity as well. And we'll get into the Christianity aspect even more in a second here. But just to kind of tie it all up, both Set and the Hushtan were associated with healing and fertility magic. Both are seen on a pole or standard. Set was sometimes a serpent, especially later, and the Hushan is a serpent. Both are related to the high places. Both are related to sacred trees. Set is the son of the goddess, the sky goddess, whereas the Hushan has some sort of relationship to the goddess as a Shara, though we're not completely sure what this relationship is. Set was the consort of Anat and Astarte, whereas Nehushtan was related to Asherah, who was also related to Anat and Astarte. 
Set was identical to Baal, and Nehushtan was always related to altars of Baal. Set was important in the opening of the mouth ritual, and Nehushtan seems to have been caught up in this Jewish opening of the mouth ritual as in the form of a seraphim. And finally, both Set and Nehushtan were demonized by forces that came later trying to take their power from themselves and put themselves above those beings. So now as we move kind of from uh, early Jewish traditions into Christianity, I want to reiterate that to Gnostics, such as the Ophites and Setians, the serpent was not seen as evil, but a hero who came to give mankind knowledge of truths beyond the material world. Even in the Bible proper, it is said that Christ must reflect the serpent on a pole, the Nehushtan, to save humanity from sin. John 3 states, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Very interesting that this is something that, again, we have evidence of it being kind of appropriated from another group to get their power. Now, in a lot of cases, Christ and this serpent were seen as one and the same, or at least different manifestations of the same being. In the Apocryphon of John, Christ says, But what they call the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the archons and demiurge stayed in front of it in order that Adam might not look up to his fullness and recognize the nakedness of his shamefulness. But it was I who brought about what they ate. Not only does Jesus venerate the serpent in its act, he also identifies himself with both. We have already shown that the serpent and Nehushtan connect to Set, but what about the Gnostic Christ directly? Within Sethian Gnosticism, the third son of Adam, Seth, is seen as another manifestation of the serpent or Christ. Is it possible that the Seth of Judaism and the Egyptian god Set, who is known as Seth in Greek, are one and the same? In one example, Christ is not actually crucified, but looks on at amusement, looks on in amusement at the event. Set also never dies and survives the day of his death in the pyramid text because he was associated with the circumpolar constellations rather than the ones which set, rise, and have more obvious changes due to the procession of the equinox. Throughout the second great treaty of Seth, Christ or Seth openly calls the solar tradition or what we might call the Western right-hand path a, path, a path of slavery and dogma, and that those engaging with such a path are ignorant down to their very soul. If he was saying this about the followers of Osiris, which in a way he may be, I can picture Seth being quite happy with this. Let's look at another quote here from the first stele of Seth. I bless his power, which was given to me, who caused the maleness that really are to become male three times. Note that maleness, maleness is heavily tied to Set, and three times was a common theme when the Greeks worked with Egyptian gods. For instance, Thoth is called the thrice great. To quote the word of Set in the coffin text when driving back Apep, I am male, so cover your head. I am hostile. I am one great in magic, which I have sent forth against you. The Gnostic verse also mentions begotten without beginning, in which we see a resemblance to Set in his unnatural birth as a fully grown being. But the connections do not stop here. When we get to Egyptian Gnosticism specifically with the Gospel of the Egyptians, we find many correlations to Set. The Gospel speaks of a seed of Set, I'm sorry, a seed of Seth, and a great pastor of Seth. This recalls how Set survived the day of his death by plowing the earth, according to the pyramid text. And it can also connect to Set in his form as a bull or, of a bull or donkey, the later being the most pop popular in Greek and Roman times. Sodom has, is mentioned in, a, in connection with Seth and has been mythologically associated with support, supposedly immoral or non-traditional sex acts, both of which we can tie to Seth. And as a god of infertility and such, who have been easily associated with acts that do not lead to reproduction. In the Osiris myth, Seth attempts to attack Horth the Younger by sodomizing him, which we are clearly meant to read, read as a bad thing, despite their relationship originally being a positive consensual one. There is mention of a plant of Seth in the Gospels, and Set was often associated with the sedge plant of Upper Egypt, a symbol for that half of the kingdom. A book of Seth is mentioned, and it's written and placed upon a mountain, another high place, where the sun does not rise, in the darkness. And Set was, of course, the lord of darkness in the mountainous deserts. Finally, the Seth of the text has vanished from human memory, and all but the initiate have failed to hear his name or word for thousands of years as was the case with Set until the Egyptian traditions were re rediscovered. 
In the Gnostic text on the origin of the world, we read how well it suits all men on the subject of chaos to say it is a kind of darkness. But in fact, the shadow comes from a product that has existed since the beginning. Chaos would be the equivalent of the Egyptian god Apep, the chaos serpent. And Set was equated with him after demonization. Now this verse in Gnosticism calls into very question the idea, the idea that chaos and darkness are the same thing, thus making darkness somehow evil or amoral at least. We are told chaos is not darkness at all, and that darkness is something more foundational and ontologically primitive than chaos. This is followed up in the Nicene Psalm where Jesus says, She is trying to flee bitter chaos and does not know how she is to escape. Send me forth, I shall manifest the forms of the gods and teach them the secret of the holy way which I call Gnosis. Here the Gnostic Christ is not only a chaos, chaos god hero, but a polytheist as well. He mentioned gods plural. And this ties back to him being kind of a, a chaos conf hero. You know, he's defending her from chaos. He says, you know, she's trying to flee bitter chaos and does not know how to escape. Send me forth. So we have all these, uh, you know, they're kind of, they're very, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. They're not the tightest connections between this set or between our set and the Seth Christ of Sethian Gnosticism. However, I've taken the time to go through all this to sh and share all these quotes and comparisons because I want you to see how even without any absolute and certain connection, we can tie all these beings, Set, the serpent, Seth, Christ, and Nehushtan, as well as the donkey together. On top of what I've kind of gone over so far, we have far more solid evidence for the connection of of, of these beings, and that is the Secret Books of the Egyptian Gnostics by Jean Dorsey, where she explains that we find later some curious traces of a cult of this Seth Typhoon presiding over Judeo Gnostic rituals, attested by the existence of the Egyptian figurines of the god Seth. There is no doubt about the identification of the god worshipped in this guise as one of the great figures of Gnosticism. The pedestal is engraved with the name Abermenthio, which I butchered, but which denotes Jesus. Therefore, there can be actually little doubt at all that Set equals the serpent equals Nehushtan equals the Gnostic Christ. The connection between Set and Christ is confirmed in other sources as well, with Set spearing Apep as a possible origin for Christian dragon slaying myths. Now, this version of Christ obviously did not survive, with Gnosticism being severely suppressed by the church. Interestingly, the first image of Christ being crucified we've ever found represents Christ as a donkey. So kind of from this point forward, not much has happened. Set, as understood as the Egyptian god, has kind of been entirely lost by this point. And what we've been talking about in the past few sections with the Nehushtan and Christ and stuff is kind of more work of modern recovery than something that they understood at the time. So from the fall of Egypt through the Greeks and then Judeo-Christianity, we kind of, what we've covered already kind of covers that whole period. And then as the Enlightenment came into being, this set may have been viewed more positively now and then, but basically nothing was known as known about him with modern Egyptology essentially beginning at the time of Napoleon. So common mythical entities were focused on after the enlightenment, such as the Roman Lucifer, Christian devil, and the Greek Prometheus rather than the Egyptian set. The Western esoteric tradition in the late 18th and the 19th centuries was happy to adopt what little it can know of Egyptian myth at the time which was essentially the idea of the Osiris myth as the one true universal spiritual truth of Egypt, kind of like how we would see Christianity in the modern era. Well, at the, t at the Enlightenment time, not, not in the 21st century. Therefore, even esoteric groups who may have seen positives in beings like Lucifer, or even the devil, still usually relegated Sesh, uh, Set to the realm of evil. He, was, he didn't really recover that for a very long time. And this would only begin to change with Aleister Crowley, probably the most influential occult thinker of the 20th century in his religion of Thelema. So Crowley claimed, claimed to have a three-day divine experience in Egypt, where he recorded, recorded the words of an unknown entity he called Iwas. The record of this was called the Book of the Law, and it has been posited that this entity Iwas was one and the same with the Egyptian god Set. I would even argue that the name Iwas could simply be Crowley putting a spin on the Was Scepter of Set, such as I the Was, as in Was Scepter. Prior to his experience, Crowley had been exposed to the Steel of Revealing, as it's known in Thelema, 
an Egyptian stele housing Ra holding a Waw scepter, Newt, and Horus the Elder in the form of a solar disk. The three chapters of the Book of the Law, one written on each of the three days, corresponds to the three gods blatantly shown, Newt, Horus, and Ra. It therefore only makes sense that the fourth entity would be the fourth one on the stele, the Waw scepter, the embodiment of Set. This was likely the great turning point and reemergence of the god Set in the modern era, or in the modern era, despite the severe inaccuracies, with Crawley even sometimes admitting Iwas was meant to be Set, who he also equa equated wrongly with the devil. One of Crawley's most famous students, Kenneth Grant, deeply resonated with the identification of Iwas and Set, writing his expansive and, ex and eccentric Typhonian trilogies in honor of the deity. Grant came to identify the fall of the stellar tradition as the start of the road leading us to monotheism as we know it today, stating that the degradation of the star Sothis, of the great bear, bear, Draco, and other types of eternity proved to be the creation of hell. Another drawn to Set was Michael Aquino, who founded the Temple of Set in 1975. Whatever one thinks of Aquino and his Temple of Set, or of Grant and Crowley, the three played an undeniable role in the resurgence of interest in Set in the modern era. Now, as the 20th century progressed, academia also began to turn its eyes more towards Set, where previously the Osiris story as told by Plutarch was seen as a universal myth in the way of Christianity in the Dark Ages. Even some of the earlier works that dove into the god, such as Tevelde's famous Seth, God of Confusion, tended to apply a negative bias towards Set, as he was understood in the latest periods. The Conflict of Horns and Seth by Griffiths, Griffiths in 1960 did a better job of illustrating the diversity Set experienced in Egyptian history. And in the modern day, we have dissertations like Deconstructing the Iconography of Set by Taylor and Seth, a mystery representing God in the Egyptian Pantheon by Turner as well as papers like Seth, God of Power and Might by Cruz Urib, and independent researchers such as Joan Lansbury. And all these have come together to help bring Set out of his longest slump yet, to be recognized as this once great deity and, and benevolent being who was widely worshipped and highly regarded for thousands of years. And this is something that I hope to continue to play a role in going forward. And with that, we are kind of caught up on the history of Set. Um, the only exception here being everything that comes after the his kind of interest in occultism. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on Grant and Crawley and the Temple of Set and Aquino and all that. So I don't, I'm not going to go back through all that here as these are all just modern interpretations of uh, the God that I'm trying to describe in this video. There are some other things I'd like to touch on though. For instance, it is quite common for people to confuse the set animal with other beings that are dog-like. Uh, for example, Anubis, he's often confused with who is jackal-headed instead of having the head of the Shaw animal. But there are simple ways to identify Set um, if you can't read the accompanying hieroglyphics, which can also vary greatly themselves. The two most defining features of the Shaw are the curved snout and ears that flare out. Compared to this, jackals will have a straighter snout, a straighter snout and pointed ears. Further, the Shaw animal in Egypt will always have its tail shooting straight up and topped with various designs whereas other more jackal-like gods will have their tail down and they don't have a design on the top of it. As for honoring Set, in truth it is more about the individual and their intent rather than what one does. I like to say that magical ceremony and ritual is more for us than any deity. This is not to call psychodrama, this is not to call magic psychodrama in the mundane way of modern psychological occultism. We are not just speaking to ourselves in the dark. Gods simply do not need material things like food and water. They do not require specific gestures or movements. In the case of Set, a god of the stellar tradition in Western left-hand path, you can almost say doing what is expected would be a turnoff, if anything, and I highly recommend if you do ritual, you create your own. That said, the desert and night sky are the realms of Set, so the best place to do such magic would be in the desert at night. His main astronomical symbol is the Big Dipper, specifically with it pouring out over the earth. So when you look up, it will be at the top of the sky. And this is discussed in Seeking the Imperishable Constellations of Ancient Egypt. If you cannot do it under the Dipper in such a position, I would recommend having an image of it to focus on. And I actually have a tattoo of the Dipper in this position for me on my forearm. So I always have it present. Food-wise, the favorite of Set has always been lettuce, so it couldn't hurt to offer some. He has been associated with both the drunkenness of alcohol and the waters of Newt, meaning that beer, liquor, or water are good to utilize. 
And I've also seen that he and Nephthys were left wine at their temple, so wine is also a good one. As the god of outside foreign things, meteoric rock falls under the domain of Set, and it can be used in ritual and ceremony. Gold is also applicable due to his associate with, association with Newt, the town of gold. His other main color is red, although black is one I've also noticed, and as uh, blue and yellow crop up frequently, and in the modern but not ancient days, I would suggest purple as well. Finally, I recommend taking information, inspiration from older texts or from places dedicated to Set, such as the Pyramid text, rather than sources in which he's demonized. As far as the temples and rituals to Set, there's not a lot that we really know in the present day, although some more research is being done at certain locations. There was a temple at Nup, which was likely the oldest temple, with it being the original one of the original sacred sites of Set. Uh, Petrie and company found pottery dating to at least the 4th dynasty there, as well as the 12th. Though Petrie actually claimed that the temple was built in the 18th dynasty. Ian Taylor in 2016 argued that the 4th dynasty pottery and mud brick walls likely implies that the temple had been worked on since the Old Kingdom, which fits considering it's one of the gods' original homes. The small temple and related pyramids are on the edge of the desert, which Set was of course associated with, and the site contained images of hippos who were sacred to the god, as well as Set giving life to Horus, which was added in the 18th dynasty by Tutmos III during his restoration of the temple. This is also where we see the king being blessed by Set. Amenhotep II did further renovations in the 18th dynasty, and in the 19th, Ramses II worked on the temple as well. It's from these two dynasties that we find many beautiful items related to the god, including a copper axe, several tablets, and a seven-foot-tall wasp scepter that seems to have been gifted to someone and possibly used in actual ritual. Ramses III may have been the last to work on the temple, and during that time the 20th dynasty lintels were carved, praising Set, Amun, and Ra, who were often worshipped together in the New Kingdom, as said. Set is also shown as a winged, bull-headed god here. An offering table from Seti I, showing Set on a throne and Seti before him adoring the god four times, possibly comes from this temple, or at least the locale as well. Possibly now the most studied temple of Set is at Mut el Ka'arab. Ka'arab? I, I doubt I'm pronouncing that right. It was the capital of the Dakla Oasis, where Set worship survived until the late period after being driven from the Nile area during the, the Third Intermediate. We have confirmation that the main temple here was dedicated to Set as Lord of the Oasis, along with several other deities. This temple was in full swing by at least the 21st dynasty, possibly being founded in the 18th, though pottery at the site goes as far back as the 6th dynasty. Whether there was official temple there the whole time or not, worship of Set in the Oasis dates back to at least the Old Kingdom. Here the Libyan connection to Set, one of his original forms, Ash, being Libyan, were strengthened. As was common in the New Kingdom, Set was worshipped alongside in relation to Amun, Atum, and Ra, as well as Thoth, who took over the positive aspects of Set once demonization hit the Oasis. In their follow-up paper, Hope and Olaf uh, in 2011 confirmed that the temple was functioning at least in the Ramside period, which would have been the 19th dynasty, and, reinforce, and they reinforced the strong connection between Set, Amun, and Ra. We even have confirmation of prophets to set here, and that the priesthoods were shared between all these deities. Due to its isolation and separation from the Nile, the worship of set here survived through the Roman period without issue, providing one of the most quote-unquote recent insights into the temples of the gods. Nephthys was also worshipped in the same location alongside her consort, and the most common offering given to them was wine. There was a temple of Set at Motmar that was established during the 19th dynasty, probably by Ramses II, and he actually tore down a temple to the Aten that had stood on the site and built the temple of Set over it. A stele of Set, Taret, and Ptah was found here, and Set is also shown as a winged deity with Hittite features. We also have written confirmation that Set was the patron deity of this temple at this time. Within the temple, Ramses was praised as beloved of Set, and the whole thing really highlights how important Set was in defeating Autonism. Within the temple and city, the most frequently used colors for Set are red, blue, and yellow. The city was also devoted to Set, and many had personal items revering the gods, including, including plaques, scarabs, statues, ivory, items equating Set and Baal, and Set is even seen wearing the double crown. 
While it was not found in the temple area and predates it by many centuries, I always found it interesting that we find one of the oldest uses of a pentagram for a personal symbol I've ever seen with its, its point pointing downwards. While it is known that Set worship blossomed at Avaris under the Hyksos, the 400 year stele suggests that the area was sacred to the god before the Hyksos even arrived or gained power. Indeed, his worship may date, to, date till Dynasty 12 in the area. Either way, the Hyksos king Apep built a temple to Set, his father, quote unquote, there, which may have been where Seti I and Ramses I served as priests to their patron. This temple rested south of the other temples, as we would also see in Pi Ramses. Now, Pi Ramses was a city located in the Nile Delta near Avaris, tying its creation to the worship of the god. While technically founded in the 18th dynasty, the temple of S with the temple of Set there being restored by Seti I, the city became the capital under Ramses II, and it was inhabited through the 20th dynasty before demonization of the deity began. The city was broken into four parts, each dedicated to a deity, Set in the south, Amun in the west, Wajet the serpent goddess in the north, and Astarte in the east. Pi Ramses housed many foreign citizens and all lived in peace with each other, including the formerly enemy Hittites. It has been theorized that part of the reason Pi Ramses was abandoned was due to the demonization of Set. It is possibly from this temple of Set that we get the 400 year stele, as it was found in Tanis but dates to at least Ramses II, so it was likely moved when Set worship was driven out of Pi Ramses. There may have been a temple to Set at Saka, where he was linked with Amun and worshipped as a bull. I believe this was related to Bata the Bull and the Tale of Two Brothers, but I'm not 100% sure on that. At Su, said to be where Set was born, there was a temple to the gods starting in the 12th dynasty. Ramses III made a record of there being such a temple as well. At Separ Meru, there appears to have been temples to both Set and Neftis. And a temple of Set is said to have existed in Medjem. Finally, there is a temple of Thoth at Ankh, which may have overwritten a temple of Set there, or at least had at a significant shrine or chapel to Set, as well as being dedicated to Thoth. The pyramid texts that I've been mentioning throughout kind of this entire video are the oldest religious scriptures in human history. They can be scattered, repetitive, and often contradictory. This was not only due to the language being archaic, but also due to there being several competing ideologies, most importantly between that of Set and Osiris. The text can go from praising Set to demonizing him as the murderer of Osiris, from comparing the dead to Osiris to spells warding off him and his followers. I personally see the pyramid text as almost a form of early poetry comparable to the last topic we discussed on the channel, which was Lord Byron's poem and play, Cain, a Mystery. And I've argued for a long time, which is not a common idea, but I would continue to argue it to this day that in the pyramid text, we can already see a lot of ideology that applies to what we now call the Western left-hand path. Like there's a lot of ideas that they share in common, even though the Western left-hand path wasn't something that would come to exist much later. I'll link it in the description, but I have a much more detailed uh, look at the, what I call the Setian pyramid texts, although I don't really like that name anymore. But I basically tried to pull out verses that I thought were related to Set and kind of create, recreate these pyramid texts in a way that theoretically may have applied to worshippers of Set, but it is it should be noted that it is very much a modern interpretation of this. And it has footnotes about like different terminologies and stuff from the pyramid text. Also, if you can bear it, I highly recommend you just read through the pyramid text a couple times, but it is understandably very difficult to get through. So I'd mentioned that in the pyramid text, it's actually Set that gives the power of the Eye of Horus its power. And this is um this is in line 48 using Samuel Mercer's translation. To say Osiris, t Osiris N, and I should mention that N. I'll just say N. It's usually where the dead's name is inserted into the pyramid text. So to say Osiris N, take to thyself the finger of Set, which causes the white eye of Horus to see, to see. To say Osiris N, take to thyself the eye of Horus, that it may shine, shine upon the finger of Set. So here in the pyramid text, it's actually Set and Horus kind of giving each other their power, rather than that power being bestowed upon the eye by Thoth after the injury. At line 146, we have Osiris, thou dost not gain power over Set, thy son gains not power over him. Horus, thou dost not gain power over Set, thy father gains not power over him. So this 
really clearly kind of starts to illustrate how there were different ideologies competing here during the pyramid texts, even within the texts themselves as they've been compiled in the modern day. For me, one of the key things that ties the pyramid texts to modern Western left-hand path ideology is the idea that the dead becomes a god as powerful as all the other gods. Indeed, the dead is given all the powers of pretty much all the gods. They are allowed to decide which gods will live and will die for them within their own afterlife. And so this is this is much different where we have not only deification, but actually like deicide in some cases, like the killing of gods that one doesn't like all the way back in the very first human religious scripture. So that is that is in no way some sort of modern invention. And we're talking about a person becoming this God. We're not just talking about stories like, of course, gods can kill each other in stories, but we're talking about human beings becoming that powerful with the pyramid texts. Another interesting thing here is that son of Newt is often referring to Set in the pyramid texts, like we mentioned, and that the dead is compared to copper and bronze and materials that have been associated with Set in their immortality. One of my favorite verses that I think illustrates both the early set and the modern West Sound left hand path is 658. Thy step is great, that it may traverse the sky. Thou art not seized by the earth gods, thou art not rejected by the planets. We already mentioned the importance of the sycamore tree, sycamore tree a bit, but it even gets brought up in direct in front, uh, reference to the circumpolar stars in, uh, in line 689 to say thy particular. Thy protective sycamore is thy corn. Thy corn is thy protective sycamore. Thy tail shall be in thy mouth, combat serpent. Turn thyself around thy turning great bowl. So these, of course, are representing the cycle of the northern polar constellations, which always turn, and their connection with immortality, which itself connects to sycamore trees in ancient Egypt, and again connects into immortality in Judaism and Gnosticism from the fig tree that the serpent allowed Adam and Eve to eat from. Throughout the text, the individual becomes a literal star in the sky, and this is what is considered their godhood. And the gods are, of course, like the stars were gods, that's how they were understood. And another way that we see kind of a prelude to Western left hand path ideology here is that most of the gods cycle and they rise and set, but the individual soul becomes something that never rises and sets, it becomes imperishable among the imperishable stars. So there's a lot of that same, you can see a lot of the poetic similarities kind of between that and something like we were discussing in Cain, where Cain become, is going to become an immortal being greater than anything that's ever lived in the material world after his death. I'm going to read a, a little longer one here. It's um, 1,143 to 1,148, those lines. And I just think this so well in company, uh, encompasses what I'm trying to say about the left-hand path symbolism and ideas as early as the pyramid texts. And actually, just to kind of drive this home a little more, I'm going to replace N where the name of the dead is supposed to stand in just with you. So you lead the gods, you direct the divine boat, you seize heaven, its pillars and stars. The gods come to you bowing, the spirits escort you to your bow. They wreck in their war clubs, they destroy their weapons. For behold, you are a great one, the son of a great one, whom Newt has born. Your power is the power of set of ombos. You are the great wild bull. You are the pouring down of rain. He who came forth as the great, or sorry, he who came forth as the coming into being of water. For he is the serpent with many, for you are the serpent with many coils. You are the scribe of the divine book. Who says what is and causes to exist what is not. You are the red bandage who came forth from the great one. You are the eye of Horus. You are stronger than men, mightier than the gods. Horus carries you, Set lifts you up. If somebody wants to try and argue that that resembles what we know of right-hand path ideology more than left-hand path ideology, I'd be very open to that. But I honestly think from that kind of reading, it's really clear that this thought dates back a lot farther than a lot of people give it credit for. Another interesting line is 1267, let not Osiris come in his evil coming, do not open to him thine arms. Now this is part of a larger thing where it says this about many gods, let them not come in their evil coming. But I just want to throw it in there that Osiris is included among the rest of the gods as an equal here. And if you read the Conflicts of Horus and Seth by Griffiths, he, he really breaks this down about 
the three stages of the pyramid text where it's Horus and Set, and then they're kind of all equals, and it's Horus and Osiris versus Set. And just the last one I'll read to you here is actually my favorite. It's uh, 1667. As the name of Set and Ombos endures, so may your name endure. So may your pyramid endure. So may your temple endure. Likewise, forever and ever. And with that verse, I honestly can't think of a more perfect place to end for our purposes here. So I hope that you've learned something. I will definitely link below um, my written version of this, as well as I think there was a couple other things I said I would reference. And I'll give also my recommended reading list for all the citations for the original paper, which are in the paper that I'll link. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope it was informative and I hope to see you again next time.